Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar about sustainable digital creativity. My name is Pia Repo and I work as a producer of Creative Net Project at the Art Promotion Center Finland. And together with the Center for Arts Innovation at the Oulu University of Applied Sciences, we are organizing Avara events around the theme of art and tech and sustainability. The live event of Avara will take place next week in Oulu, Finland. I'm happy to introduce today's program, a presentation of Pollinate, Pollinator Pathmaker by Alexander Daisy Ginsberg is pre-recorded. All other speakers are joining us live in this webinar. And each speaker will be introduced in more detail later. Before we start, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Um, in the end of the webinar, we'll have a little bit of time for questions. Please look at the chat box on your screen and leave a comment or a question. We will do our best to answer them. And today's webinar is being recorded. It will be available at Taika's YouTube channel after the event, and it will be subtitled within two weeks. Uh, so we welcome you to re revisit the content yourself and share it with your colleagues. And most of the speaker slides uh, will be published at the Avara event page afterwards. Last summer, I came across with a very timely book called Sensing, Sensing Earth, Cultural Quests Across a Heated Globe. And there is a perfect quote to serve as a bridge to this webinar. Quote is from the article written by a sociocultural anthropologist, Noel B. Salazar. By now, people have become very aware of the ecological costs of flying. However, climate mitigation involves so much more than the mere reduction of carbon emissions. For one, the gigantic environmental damage caused by our massive use of internet is much less known. Luckily, organizations such as the London-based charity Julie's Bicycle, which supports the cultural and creative sector to act on climate change and environmental sustainability, are already at work to make people and institutions aware of their digital carbon footprints. In sum, what is needed are radical systemic changes, changes for which the cultural and creative sector should not carry all the burden, but certainly has an exemplary role to play. And with these words, warmly welcome art curator Alice Bonnot, environmental sustainability specialist of Julie's Bicycle. Alice, uh, stage is yours now. Great, thank you, Pia. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. Great. Um, yes, thank you again for the invitation to be here today. Warm welcome everyone to this webinar. My name is Alice Bono. I'm an environmental sustainability specialist at Judy's Bicycle. And today I'll be presenting on sustainable digital creativity. Um, so first I'll be talking about what we mean by digital impact, how digital impacts are created and where they come from. And then I'll share some eco-responsible solutions and practical actions that you can take to reduce the environmental impact of your devices, as well as case studies from the arts and culture sector. Um, but first, very quickly, for those of you who are not familiar with the work of Judy's Bicycle, um, as Pia kindly mentioned, we're a nonprofit organization mobilizing the arts, cultural and creative community to take action on the climate, nature and justice crisis. We were funded by the UK music industry in 2007, and we now work across the creative and cultural community in the UK, but also internationally. We do so by bringing all our passion, creativity and faith in culture to contribute to this huge global challenge. We look to influence climate policy, leadership development programs for artists and cultural practitioners, climate justice, and ultimately to drive climate action at scale. And the way that we do so includes from skills training um, and programs, developing and providing resources, research, partnership work, and policy development. 
So in our drive for a sustainable, environmentally conscious and regenerative arts and culture sector, it is important that we take a holistic approach to reducing carbon emissions and environmental costs. So this approach, of course, extends to the responsibility management of our digital footprint, which we're discussing today. So um, electronic devices, be they smartphones, tablets, laptops, gaming consoles, and any other electronic gadgets that we use on a daily basis, have become integral parts of our lives, and we're increasingly relying on them to carry out our daily tasks, whether that's personal or professional. What happens is that we seemingly engage in those digital activities, often as a matter of habit, with that conscious consideration. And this is because digital pollution is invisible, it's odorless, and it's hard to detect. But just because we can't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, right? In fact, digital technology relies entirely on a physical structure, an infrastructure that consumes energy, and a lot of energy. But often this confusion comes from the dematerialized nature of digital. Um, but we know now that dematerialization or the reduction of physical materials doesn't necessarily equate to decarbonization or the reduction of carbon emissions. So that's why it's very crucial to remember that the internet and technology usage have environmental and social impacts, which are present in the next slides. And those should be acknowledged, they should be discussed, even though they're somewhat invisible in nature. This growing um, urgency to tackle this issue sits within the context of an increasing prevalence of planned device obsolescence, rapid consumption trends that are intensifying our digital footprint and e-waste, and increasing infrastructure efficiency, which is expected to drive even greater data consumption. So by this point, you might wonder, okay, but how bad or, or digital impact? Well, researchers have estimated that the internet could consume more than a fifth of the world's electricity by 2025. And by then it's estimated that it will overtake the automotive sector and that by 2030 it will be the largest emitter of carbon. So if we compare the figures between 2015 and 2021, we can see a 60% increase in internet users going from three to almost 5 billion. Internet traffic has quadrupled and there's a significant increase in data center energy usage and in data transmission network energy users as well. Um, on all those slides, I've put the sources of where the information is coming from. So once we share the slides, you'll of course be able to look at the report and um, see all the information available there. So now, um, if we were to summarize this, would say that the IT sector, if it was a country, um, it would be the third um, highest consumer in terms of electricity uh, consumption. If the internet was a country, it's the green gas house emissions that would rank the sixth largest polluter. So now let's look at where is this coming from? So a report from Greenpeace done in 2016, um, titled Click Green, breaks down the electricity consumption in the IT sector. So here we can see that the largest quadrant um, is devices with 34%. Communication networks come second um, with 29%, and then comes data centers, 21%, and manufacturing, 16%. So I'll show you on the next slide exactly what those um, are for, but we can see already that using um, we're using more energy um, through using our devices than we are in building them. So if we look at um, the highest uh, consumption being devices, um, so it's not only the energy that is required to power our devices, but it's also the considerate issue of electronic waste or e-waste. And that is the equipment, the hardware, and the devices ending up as toxic waste in landfills or incinerators as well as the dangerous informal disassembly operations that are hazardous to people and planet. And it's important to remember that electronic waste contains uh, toxic components that are dangerous to human health, such as mercury, lead, cadmium, barium, and lithium. And there's also the negative um, health effects of those toxins on humans, which includes the brain, the heart, the liver, and the kidney. So some solutions already might include reducing or consumption of devices, you know, you're not always wanting to buy the latest um, smartphone, but instead trying to use your devices as long as possible. And really, if you have to buy a new one, um, well, actually buying secondhand is always um, better. And then, of course, recycling and refurbishing it um, when the device 
is no longer usable. As you saw on the graph, on the graph from Greenpeace, the second um, highest source of pollution was from networks. So those are communication networks that transmit our data. And that includes the construction, the operation, and the maintenance of networks for both mobile and fixed networks. Then came the data centers, because cloud data is stored not in actual clouds, but in buildings. And so that requires huge data centers to store all of our data in the cloud and to host all of the information of the internet so that we can access it 24 seven. Those data centers are very, very energy intensive and they need to be permanently air conditioned to be cold. Otherwise, as you know, um, you know, cables could just um, start a fire and they'll be really um, not safe. So they need to be air conditioned um, constantly to be cold and safe. So data storage, as I wrote here, equals the equivalent of five nuclear power plants in the world. And we have to remember that the volume of stored data doubles every two years. So that's really um, enormous amount of data we're talking about and enormous data centers that are required to make sure that we can um, access this data at any time we want. Lastly, um, but as importantly, if not more, or the manufacturing aspects that comes with the human cost and environmental cost. Um, so there's the human cost coming from some materials that are mined in conditions of harmed conflicts and human rights abuses. Miners are often working in safe conditions for very unfair wages. And then the environmental cost um, is the mining for minerals and metals uh, that are very water intensive, that causes deforestation and land degradation, and that leaves behind very toxic waste in water and in soil. Sometimes images are stronger than words. So I've included those um, next two slides. And the image, this one is of a, a, a Colton mine. Um, I invite you to perhaps find the initial source because it's a little bit blurred. But already you can see that um, there's a lot of people involved in um, extracting those resources, um, which those mines have financed harm conflicts in Congo and Rwanda. And the second picture is in Chile, where the water is evaporated to obtain lithium that fuels the battery. So although it's quite a pretty colorful pictures, this is not what nature would look like in its normal state. This is from um, humans extracting some resources um, to create those batteries that are um, not very lasting anyway when we use our devices. So um, we might ask ourselves, where are we now? And before I share some practical actions to minimize those environmental and social costs, I just would like to take a moment to acknowledge the additional and timely considerations. So as with the climate crisis, digital environmental harms are unequally distributed and the people and places most affected and places um, most connected to those um, in, you know, impact are generally the least respons responsible. There's also um, the important aspect that not everyone has access or easy access to digital culture. Um, those can be people who can't afford devices, older people who can't use digital technology, or people with visual and hearing impairments. There's also quite important, um, in my opinion, the we know the excessive screen time has detrimental effects on both physical and mental well-being. So a digital detox is not only good for the planet, but it's also good for digital users. And it can provide numerous benefits for your mental health um, and physical health, including improved sleep quality, reduced stress and anxiety, and increased self-awareness and mindfulness. So now let's talk about how can we achieve this digital sobriety. So in the next slides, I'm going to share um, quite a lot of recommendations that, um, again, you'll be able to view um, from the PDF that we'll put on the presentation of this webinar, if you wanted to get back to it later. But the first and immediate thing that you can do almost as soon as we finish this webinar is to do a digital declutter and start with your inbox, with your mailbox. So we recommend using instant messaging systems instead of emailing because it's been proven to consume less energy. Um, when you talk, when you look at the impact of mails being sent on a daily basis, we know that a single email sent is equivalent to the CO2 emitted by a light bulb burning for 25 minutes. So each time you send an email, think about this light bulb being on for the next 25 minutes. 
And since we estimate that each professional ignores on average 6,000 file attachments per year, which I've done the, the quick math equals to 105 days, um, we can see that it's very important to regularly delete the heaviest emails with attachments that we have. And to do that is very simple. You go to your um, email app, you click on sort by, then you can um, select size or attachment so that the emails will be sorted by the um, heaviest attachments. There you can decide which one is no longer um, relevant, which one can you delete. And then remember, of course, to um, empty the trash can throughout this cleanup process to get rid of the dormant pollution. We also encourage people to unsubscribe from mailing lists that you no longer wish to receive news from, as we know that 80% of emails are never opened. So they just sit there in the mailbox, equaling lots of light bulbs almost forever, at least until you decide to delete that email. Um, if you need to send the, the same PDF to more than one person, um, then what's good to do is to use cloud platforms like Dropbox or Drive and to include the download link in the email, as opposed to sending that one PDF as an attachment to the email. Um, because through, for instance, um, using those links, um, it's only being used once to download it, it stays on the cloud. So it's less heavy than if it was sitting on your mailbox um, until you delete it. If you have, um, however, to send one big document to just one person, then you can use um, tools like WeTransfer, that keep the file for one week, but then would just disappear as long as you have um, downloaded it. We also remind you um, that we don't have to be uh, BCC or CC all of our colleagues in all the emails. It's better to reduce the number of email recipients and only to include those that really need to receive that email. Um, we also recommend to use a minimal email signature. Um, so as fancy as very nice banners and gifts and beautiful images or, and often part of the branding of your organization. Um, it's better to not include those, but to keep a very minimal email address and email signature, sorry. And of course, to delete email accounts that you no longer use, like for instance, a, a very old um, Ot Otpel or um, Outlook email address that you've created a long time ago and that you're not really using. Again, think about it as your digital self, um, still having an impact on the environment and still having this dormant pollution. So here I've just included a, um, a small um, piece of information and that's to see the difference between um, the email types and how email types impact different um, amounts of CO2 emissions. So you can see that the least one would be a spam email picked up by your filters and then the um, most polluting one would be an email blast that takes about 10 minutes to write and that was sent to 100 people. So of course, there's always nuances and, and different um, impact linked to the type of email you send, but always keep in mind that whatever you do, um, you always will have an impact. The second area of improvement could be to, after decluttering your uh, mailbox, decluttering your social networks. This applies to personal level, but also organizational level. At the organizational level, of course, this requires some institutional knowledge and an improved communication strategy to archive organizational content correctly so that not everyone um, should just go around and, and delete content, valuable content that your organization has spent time uh, putting together. Um, but so to have a real strategy in terms of what needs to be prioritized, what can be kept or not is very crucial. So as you do for your own social media accounts, regularly deleting or archiving old content, old online content. And that could be, for instance, um, social media posts that are uh, older than five years ago, or blog articles that are maybe not as relevant as they used to be two years ago. For instance, we've decided um, that this webinar uh, and the recording of it will be available on YouTube for the next two years, but then we'll turn it down um, at the end of this period, not only because the information available in two years would have probably changed, um, but also because we are aware that we cannot leave videos on the internet forever. Um, something quite interesting that not everyone might be aware of is that in most social networks, you can disable the automatic playback of videos. And that 
um, a small detail it might seem is actually greatly helpful to reducing the power consumption of your device. Um, similar to email addresses, uh, deleting accounts that you that you no longer use. So for instance, this old Facebook account that you really not regularly go to, um, if you decided that some, that's on my to-do list of things to do actually, to take some time to perhaps save some old um, photo folders to keep the memories of um, yourself you know, 10 years ago, but then make sure that you delete it. Because again, the internet thinks that maybe one day you'll want to see this picture of you and your cat of 10 years ago. So therefore all the data centers will day and night continue to power that information so that maybe one day in the middle of the night, you decide that you might want to look at it. So really we have to think of those invisible um, information and data as being powered and cooled down um, really day and night. So making sure that the same way that you would um, recycle your waste at home, you have to do it intentionally um, digitally as well. And that also includes, for those of you who use Instagram, removing the necessary uh, saved and linked, linked, sorry, liked posts. So for instance, if you look at your account and all the um, post and content that you've saved or liked, um, some of you might have noticed that you can have access to those lists. So again, all those interactions are being saved somewhere, um, but often without asking your consent and often you're not even realizing it. So removing those things can also have uh, an impact on minimizing your digital footprint. Um, then further recommendations on greener use of the internet. Um, you've already, I'm sure, all heard about Ecosia or Lilo that are green search engines, engines that are less harmful than Google, for instance. Ecosia uses the ad revenue from um, all of our searches to plant trees where they're needed the most. Other little um, tips that actually make quite a big impact or the, um, the fact that typing the website name directly in the URL bar, as opposed to the search bar, would take less time to um, access the account. So basically each time you click on a page and all the time that is required to load the page would require energy. So the quicker you can create a route that is as quick as possible to access to the information that you need to see, the less impact you'll have. Um, similar to this, we have to limit the number of tabs or programs that are opened or to use and set up a low impact inactive tabs, um, which is available on most of our internet browsers. And that's to stop apps to run in the background. So again, the internet thinks that things should be available at all times. Um, but if we're not spending any time um, on one particular page, there's no need for it to be accessible all the time. So you might tell your computer that um, it's okay to just refresh it when you'll go back to that page. Um, clearing your browsing history um, will also have a positive impact, as well as reducing your stream and video viewing. Again, the digital detox, remember, uh, improves your mental health as well. So that'll be beneficial for you too. Um, or alternatively to watch low resolution videos and that would be less than 400p. In terms of um, phone usage, that again is both true for your personal use, but also for the use of um, your organization and, 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 and your team. Um, but you can reduce the energy required to power your phone by deleting and use applications. You can disable application notifications, um, and it's also recommended to connect via the Wi-Fi rather than for your 5G, uh, because it's been proven to consume five to 25 times more energy. Turning off your uh, Wi-Fi, um, sat-nav, or any other Bluetooth functions when you don't need them um, will also be beneficial, as well as cleaning up your history of um, text and WhatsApp messages, which I think by now you would have understood, and I'm repeating myself that everything has an impact. So everything that you perhaps want to say for the future um, might not even be worth um, doing. So really think about, is, that, is this really worth it? What are the consequences? Um, could I just constantly clean, 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 um, and tidy up my devices? Um, so same thing applies to any of your IT equipment. Um, when it comes to computers, always remembering to turning them off uh, when not in use. It would actually save your battery and make sure that you can use your um, devices longer. 
set computers, printers, and other IT equipment to go into power save mode when not in use. Often those are not by default the case, but you can just uh, make sure that from then on you, you ask those devices to go on power save mode when not being used. Unplugging chargers when equipment is fully charged, lowering screen brightness, which again might seem as a such a, a, a small thing to do, but actually adjusting the brightness of your screen will reduce power consumption and the amount of blue lights radiation emitted. Um, so it's important to apply the appropriate filters. Um, and then as I mentioned before, keeping your laptop and other digital equipment for as long as you can, and then recycling this technology and always opting for secondhand devices. Um, now, my last piece of advice would be um, about your website. And that's very relevant for organizations of all sizes that uh, spend time producing very uh, qualitative uh, content that they want to share with the community, whether that's their um, arts and culture program, news, um, values, and so on. But we have to remember the, the quantity and nature of the content present on each web page directly influence its carbon footprint, with both content and design contributing to its environmental impact. And as I explained before, it's particularly true in relation to load times. So the heavier the content, the longer it would take to load and the more energy will be required. So we recommend, and I've put two examples here, um, calculating the uh, carbon footprint of your website. So you, you can't do this for the entire website, but you can do it page by page. Um, we, we, we know the website, website carbon um, is associated with a whole grain digital or eco grader. There's others as well. So just use which one you think would work best for you. Um, then you can get an idea of how, um, what's the weight of your web pages. Um, we also recommend to advocate for the use of clean and environmentally conscious web design practices with your web designer. So that's a discussion to have with them. Some of the areas of improvement they would mention include reducing the number of pages and again, reducing the um, amount of old content. So if there's this old blog post that um, Google Analytics is telling you is not really being read, um, you might consider perhaps archiving it or deleting it because it's not really driving any traffic anyway. Reducing the number and size of images and videos. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the highest quality of the image of the video, the longer it will take to load and therefore the, the more impact. SEO is often used as well to um, reduce the digital carbon footprint because as I explained, the, the quicker the route to get to a piece of information, the less impact it will have. So a good SEO, making sure that your ranking um, is very efficient, uh, would often minimize your impact. So for instance, if you're, if someone, a visitor is looking to get some information about your opening hours, for instance, and you've done um, that piece of work well on the CEO, it would appear automatically um, on the browsers as one of the suggested pages. So if someone in that case wouldn't have to even go to your website, but would just see the information that they were looking for directly. So it's really about creating the quickest route to, to go to um, the best places. And then other things um, would also impact your website, such as the fonts. Writing clean code and using less JavaScript um, would also be beneficial. I recommend organizations such as Supercool, uh, who offer very valuable examples and comparisons that shed light on web page weight, alongside strategies for improvement through image reduction. Um, there's also an example that I, I quite like to give um, because we're working in this creative arts and culture industry, I think we're best placed to take those quite radical um, approaches. So for instance, to have um, or to consider the concept of a monochrome website, because we know that images with color, um, HD uh, would have more impact. Taking the decision aesthetically to go for a full black and white uh, website, for instance, or deciding that images are only loaded uh, dynamically when you scroll your mouse over them. Uh, would optimize the, the web page uh, performance and reduce its carbon footprint. And I think that overall, when you take those decisions, even if people those days accept, expect um, the, the best quality of the images and all those dynamic movements, um, it's really about 
having a clear message, educating your audience and explaining the reasons why um, you decided to take those decisions. And that goes for the new newsletters as well. If people those days are used to see a lot of images um, in the newsletters, just simply writing, we've consciously decided to not use images in this newsletter for those reasons, um, then the message is clear and there's no um, you know, false expectations. So a good example is the Palais de Tokyo eco mode button that they've introduced to their website. So if you don't click on this eco mode button, you'd see the website as it is. Beautiful logo, beautiful images, videos. But as soon as you click on the little eco mode button, then all the images and logos and fancy fonts disappear. Um, and actually, I mean, you'll see by yourself, but I think you you get a you know similar experience. Um, but with the reduced digital footprint. Um, now, and I think I only have five minutes left, so I'll just um, skip up this slide, which was about inviting everyone to um, organize digital cleanups at work, um, advocating and speaking up about their efforts and being transparent about them, and also um, dedicating a, a part of their um, work to offsetting. Offsetting is a whole other topic, which I'm not gonna enter into, but just mindfully, um, finding the right organizations that do great work um, is also something that on the last um, occasion you might want to do after doing everything else. But I'll just finish by showing this great example. Um, so this is the exhibition by Argentinian artist Thomas Saraceno at the Royal Pox um, Serpentine in the South Gallery in London that was presented there from uh, last June to September of this year. And this is an example an excellent example, in fact, of an art project with a strong digital awareness and demonstrating a strong commitment to reducing its digital impact, as well as inviting the public to question their relationship with screens. So Webs of Life, um, the title of the exhibition, is a living, collaborative and multi-species exhibition that dwells into how different life forms, technologies and energy systems are connected in the climate emergency. There's been many um, decisions that were taken um, throughout the making of the show. So the first one is to switch the air condition off. And remember that the show was on from June to September, so um, during summertime. So all the energy for the exhibition was instead generated by um, solar panels that were installed on the roof. Um, so on days of higher temperatures, um, rather than using the climate control, some areas of the exhibitions was closed and visitors were invited to check on the website before the visits to make sure which room were open and which were closed. In addition, the electrical items of the exhibition, and there were many, were powered with solar panels. And that's an artwork that was called Ballad of Weather Dependency. Visitors, again, were warned um, that as the sun disappears behind the cloud, artworks may switch off. And indeed, some artworks and installations were switched off all were running at lower frequency to adapt to the available power supply. Something very interesting as well in the context of what we're talking about today um, is that parts of the exhibition were free from mobile phones and lithium batteries. So visitors were invited to give your battery a break and store your device here. So you were asked to leave your phone before entering the gallery. And this work was conceived in solidarity with the indigenous communities of Salina Grandesh and Laguna de Guayatayoc, who are fighting against industrial lithium mining and their ancestral lands, and with whom the artist Thomas Araceno has an ongoing relationship for over seven years. So this commitment encouraged visitors to question their relationship with screens and the impact they have on people and planet, and were condemning against the regimes of extraction and exploitation. Other great things happened during this exhibition, um, which I found quite fascinating. The website of the exhibition and the manifesto presented on the website were powered through bikes provided to the public outside the gallery. And this artwork was called Bicycles for Life Cycles. Go as fast as you can, as slow as you must. And the pedaling of the visitors powered the reading of the manifesto that was hosted on the website of the of the exhibition um, through this integrated cycle powered web server. So I think this demonstrates quite well how artists, 
exhibition makers, creative people can really embrace those questions and actually take it at the core of their artistic decisions without feeling like they're losing um, any creative input. And just to finish, I recommend um, some of the further readings, um, including, of course, the uh, briefing report on environmental sustainability in the digital age of culture that we actually basically published in 2020, which was delivered in partnership with the Arts Council England as part of their environmental program to national portfolios organizations, as well as other links that I've put at the end of this presentation, which you're welcome to look at. And now I'd like to um, invite you all to um, watch this stream from artist Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg, um, the video where she talks about her project Pollinator Pathmaker. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you today, albeit virtually, and I'm going to share some of the work I've been doing and this idea I've been developing of algorithmic altruism. Now, if you rewind to your childhood, you may remember the windscreen on a motorway drive being covered in squashed insects. But think about now, do you still see that number of insects? And you probably don't. And that's an example of something called shifting baseline syndrome. We don't notice things as they disappear gradually in terms of the human perception of time. But of course, the loss of insects in evolutionary time is absolutely horrific. In the last 30 years alone in Germany, there's been a 75% decline in flying insects by volume recorded, and those kinds of figures are being replicated elsewhere. Now, I was asked to make an artwork to bring attention to the story, to make an artwork about the pollinator crisis. And I thought there was a great opportunity instead to make an artwork for pollinators. So once I started with that idea, the next question was, well, what is an artwork for pollinators? What would it look like was really the starting point. I began to research insect vision. So what you see here is the work of Dr. Jolyon Trosianko. On the left is a photograph of a geranium as humans see it. And on the right is an image of how a bee might see it. Bees can't see the colour red, but they can perceive ultraviolet. So they're already perceiving the world in a different way. If we zoom out to the landscape scale, what does a field of bluebells look like to a bee? It's completely startling to us with the flowers being green for a start, but this isn't actually a true image because bees can't see the same depth that we see. At two centimetres, as you see in this research, there's already a blurring and it becomes almost a complete blur by 14 centimetres. But they navigate differently, they experience the landscape differently. Bees, for example, memorise the locations of all the patches of flowers they visit in a day and can do this complex mathematical calculation to actually optimise the route between them. So I came to really sum up the developing idea with this question of if pollinators design gardens, what would humans see? And that's the idea behind Pollinator Pathmaker. I wanted to make art for pollinators' tastes, not human tastes. So how do you make a garden that is not for us? A garden, by definition, is something that humans make. And alongside other things that we make, like technologies, we make them for ourselves. And I wanted instead to think about, is it possible to make a technology or to make anything that's not ultimately for human benefit? And that's this idea of algorithmic altruism. I don't think it's possible, but it's worth exploring. So I decided to make an algorithm that could be encoded with, this, with the value of empathy. But that's actually really difficult because it's a human emotion. And how do you code that into an algorithm? So I had to think about this and I had to come up with a very functional definition. And I decided that it would be defined as supporting the maximum pollinator species possible, creating an algorithm that does this. It's about diversity. So alongside the algorithm, I work with horticulturists and pollinator scientists, and we did research in the studio to create a plant palette, a database of about 150 plants per region. And each of these plants 
we've identified which pollinators visit them. And you'll see here four of the different plants from the palette. What you may notice is that there's different amounts of pollinators that visit each. On the left, we have this beautiful lilac Michaelmas daisy and a whole load of different kinds of insects visit it. The flower has a very open head. It's co-evolved with lots of different species to be accessible. But on the right, by contrast, you'll see the Jerusalem sage and bumblebees visit this plant. It has a complex closed flower structure and the bees have co-evolved to be able to access it. Now, these plants need pollinators so they can reproduce. So this careful mutualistic relationship where insects go in, get pollen stuck on them and find this nectar reward is absolutely essential. So we have these generalists and these specialist plants. Now you can start to play with the algorithm yourself at the website pollinator.art and this is the website that is part of Pollinator Pathmaker. So when you access it you can choose your location and we now have quite a lot of Europe covered and you start to map out your garden. You can cut out spaces for paths and so on. Then you enter your garden conditions and whether what kind of soil you have what kind of light conditions and the level of exposure. And crucially, you don't need to have a garden to play with this. You can make uh, an unrealized garden as well. Then you get to play with the algorithm itself. You can choose how it's going to solve the problem, but whatever you choose, it will always optimize pollinator diversity. And then you wait and you get your living artwork with well, the potential of a living artwork and here you can explore it in its digital form. So I wanted to create this experience of, of flying through it like an insect um, might experience it but it's also not thinking about the garden as a static thing. Gardens exist in time not just in space so here you can play and see how the garden changes over the year see it from the perspective of an insect and this is really important because different flowers emerge at different times of the year for example when their pollinating species emerge as well. I also wanted to delve into the story of how insects perceive the world differently so you can turn on the pollinator filter and although this is not scientifically accurate you get a sense of how an insect may be experiencing this differently. It's a storytelling device. This is not a garden as we know it. Most importantly, you can then download the edition certificate for your unique creation and it comes with an edition number. But this is not the artwork. The artwork is fabricating it, planting it. This is an invitation to join in. So here you get a shopping list of plants and the instructions of how to actually realise your artwork. And the goal is to create the world's largest climate positive artwork for people to join in and co-create um, something that starts to knit landscapes together by um, ultimately creating one single art living artwork. Part of this strategy is with these large commissioned editions. The first was at the Eden Project in Cornwall, who originally commissioned Pollinator Pathmaker. This is me planting, so just to prove that I know a little bit about gardening because I learned on the job doing this artwork. But this is a 55 metre plot um, with about 7,000 plants that was planted in September 2021. And this was it last summer as it's coming into maturity. And it's a strange looking garden and that's really the intention. We have things that you might not arrange and put together kind of crashing up against each other and that was really a goal, was how to make something odd. The second serpentine edition was planted in Kensington Gardens last year and it's just by Lancaster Gate and uh, you can visit it. It's about 250 metres long, long with 11 meandering beds kind of stretching through the trees and existing planting. And this is a utopian space. This is a rendering of the garden seen by humans and by pollinators, but it's actually been realised and it's being visited by real insects. And strangely, it looks beautiful to us, despite my best efforts. And that's really a question, why do humans find gardens aesthetically pleasing? And why have we evolved to appreciate nature in this way?
The next edition is at the Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin, the Natural History Museum, and it's made with LAS Art Foundation. And it covers about 700 square meters. We dug up the lawn in the forecourt and have planted a huge addition there. And this was, it's, it was planted this year and it's starting to really mature and next year will be fantastic. And alongside that, we're doing scientific research. So this is a project started at the museum to use the iNaturalist platform to identify the visitors. But this is really a driver for the other part of the project, the DIY campaign and getting schools and community groups and individuals to plant at home, to bring people together, to plant and realize their own additions and start to stitch together environments, landscapes, and think about gardens, not as individual designed objects, but as nodes on a network. And I've even planted one at home. This is it in uh, September 21. And then this summer when it had got out of control and two and a half meters tall, this is not a normal looking garden and it's really fun because my job is to learn how to maintain it and to look after the different insect visitors that I've filmed here um, visiting it and try and identify them and to take care of this space for them. My responsibilities are transformed as an artist. I'm not there to, to kind of show off the artwork. My job is to look after it. So how do we do better for all species? I, you know, this is a, the most important question facing us now if we try to think about making a better world. It has to be done with values of empathy and care. The technologies we make, the decisions we realise all have to come from this idea of thinking about other species. And from an art perspective, I'm interested in presenting this idea of transforming ourselves from consumers of art into caretakers of it. Ultimately, we need to make technologies that are not ju just about us. We need to be thinking about recreating the world for all species to support us ultimately in a non-altruistic way. Wow, I'm always so pleased to, to see Daisy speak about her work. It's really beautiful. I hope everyone enjoyed as much as I did. Um, and now for our next guest speaker, I'm very happy to introduce um, Dan Bernard. He's one of the three lead artists of Fast Familiar and a senior lecturer at L London South Bank University. Um, I'm sure you'll explain a bit more what Fast Familiar is. It's an um, award-winning interdisciplinary collaboration comprising expertise in participatory theater, game design, digital technology and neuroscience and psychology based in Reading in the UK and is being joined with um, Lou R. Graves, executive director with Abandon Normal Devices. Lou began working with Abandon Normal Devices as a freelance producer with subsequent roles as program and senior producer and most recently interim director, leading on the development and delivery of an annual commissioning program, including two editions of Biennales and Festival. Hi, I'm Dan from Fast Familiar in the UK. And I can't myself. hear you, Lou. <laughs> Just unmuted myself, sorry. Yeah, so I'm Lou. I, I work for Abandoned Normal Devices. We're based in Manchester in the UK. Great. So, um, yeah, over to you, Lou. So, um, we're yeah, really delighted to be here today to talk a little bit about our project, The Network Condition. So The Network Condition is a collaboration between ourselves and Fast Familiar and another UK-based organisation called Arts Catalyst, who are based in Sheffield. Um, so over the last three years, we've been sort of working on and off to explore what we describe as the often hidden environmental impact of digital cultural production. Um, and really, you know, it's it's something that began as part of uh, Judy's Bicycle and Arts Council England Accelerator program. Um, and it's really it was really about, you know, three small arts organisations coming together, figuring out how we could share knowledge and resources to and kind of better understand and lower the impact of our own digital work. Um, and we did this through um, a series of case studies with artists, so having conversations with them. Um, we also developed a tool um, to support artists and producers to better understand their impact as well, which uh, Dan will talk a little bit about uh, shortly. 
Right, so this is a talk of two halves. So in the first half, we're going to talk about the efforts that we've made to lower our own impact and to help other people lower their impact. And then in the second half, we're going to talk a little bit about the impact that digital art can maybe have on environmental action by sharing some case studies with some of our favourite digital artists. Um, so as part of the Networks Condition Project, Fast Familiar made various efforts to lower the impact of our own digital projects. Um, so just to pick one of our projects for an example, the Acquisitions Panel is an interactive theatre performance by Fast Familiar, which explores how we choose the stories that we tell about the past. In the piece, 12 audience members, who are the whole audience, for an audience of 12, take on the role of a citizens' acquisitions panel who are appointed to make decisions about what to display in a museum and how to display it and what story to tell about it. The object that they have in front of them has a complex colonial past. And as they're seated around the table, they each have an iPad on which they watch videos of experts and members of diaspora communities. They read documents about the object and they receive prompts to discuss the object together and to vote. So we did some analysis of the energy use of the piece because it runs on iPads. And we realized that the video syncing system, because it's playing 12 videos at once, um, and it's we're trying to ensure that all of those videos are playing in sync at the same time. That was the largest source of power consumption in the piece. So my colleague, Joe, who's a digital artist, he writes code. He rewrote the code in the system to make it 26% more energy efficient. So the old system used to rely on communicating constantly between the 12 iPads 10 times a second. And with the new system, Joe was able to use artificial intelligence to predict when an iPad would come out of sync. And then it would fix the issue before it arised, and that reduces the need for constant communication. So we're now at the point where each performance uses 10% of the power that you would use to boil a mud of water for a kettle. So it's really kind of low impact now. And it's also really helpful for us because it means we need to charge the iPads less often. Uh, it's worth noting that this project also tours by train because we designed it so that everything could fit into three backpacks. So we don't need to use cars or vans. And we've even traveled as far as Copenhagen from the UK by train. Uh, and I wrote a blog about that kind of experience of international touring by train and what we learned about it, which is on the Fast Familiar website. Uh, we also worked, did some other projects, but um, they, we've blogged about them on our site, but I don't have time to go into them now. Um, but when we did we designed our website, our own website, one of our aims was to reduce its energy footprint to less than it currently was. It was already running on renewable energy servers, but we wanted to use less of that energy because until there's a grand restructuring of the whole world order, we can't just merrily waste all of the renewable energy that we can get our hands on. So with that, we've therefore been experimenting with how to make the most energy efficient website that we can have that still looks like a top class professional website. So again, if you want to have a look at it, you can go to fastfamiliar.com. Um, we've now received Arts Council fund, um, funding from Arts Council England to create a carbon neutral website template that other artists in England can use to build their websites and other companies. So the websites will be hosted on servers that are powered by renewable energy and they'll be designed to be energy efficient. So the way that you build the website will encourage you to build it in an energy, energy efficient way. At the moment, we've been consulting with artists from dis different disciplines about what they need in a website and about how to make the templates easy to use. And the platform is currently in a kind of beta test testing phase, and then we'll sort of roll it out to the public next year, hopefully. Uh, thanks, Dan. So um, I'm just going to share a little bit about a project um, that we did in 2021. So as part of our sort of programme, we, we have a festival that happens every two years in a different location. It's very site specific. Um, the last edition we delivered was in 2021. Um, so we we're still on partial lockdown um, during the COVID pandemic. So we actually delivered a hybrid programme. Um, so uh, we developed this festival hub. So we wanted to kind of explore how we might kind of sort of translate some of that site specificity to kind of audiences that were that were kind of joining us online. So it was kind of part part artistic commission, part information portal. Um, and what we wanted to do is kind of, I suppose, play with some of the things that we'd been learning during this project um, and think about aesthetically how we could 
um, lower the impact of the of the hub and um, the environmental impact but also kind of do that in quite a sort of a playful way that we could sort of bring the audience into that conversation as well um so we did this in a in a number of ways with the hub so um the first thing we did was allow audiences coming to the hub to choose their own compression style so from like the high resolution to the, the lowest level resolution so there were three different options they could choose um we also um had sort of what we described as waste floating in the background of the map um which is composed of traces of online activity so cookies um and pieces of data that compose the website um and then in the bottom right hand corner of the screen um there was a counter that shows the amount of waste produced by individual visits um, and navigation um, to the site in real time. So it was kind of a way for, for us to kind of start that conversation with our audiences about the impact of kind of this, this online portal. Um, so, and it's another part of the Network Condition Project, we built a tool uh, to help other artists and organisations plan the digital elements of their projects in a way that minimise their carbon footprint. So the tool is available for free on the networkcondition.com. It's designed to be easy and intuitive to use, so you can find results very quickly. You start by answering questions about your planned development process, including the devices that you uh, use to create the artwork. So for example, desktop computers tend to have a much higher footprint than laptops, for example, and the number of people working on the project and the nature of any meetings that you have as part of the project so are they physical or virtual and if they're physical how do people travel to them um, and then the second part asks you about the ways in which you're delivering the artwork so for example did you live stream the event how long was it live streamed for or was it displayed in a gallery if so what digital devices for example screens is the piece displayed on for how many hours are they switched on in the gallery uh, and so on and so on so you fill that in and at the end, it tells you the carbon footprint of the project, and it compares this to everyday examples of things that you can relate to. So, uh, for example, boiling kettles, washing machine loads, or flights. It also gives you the option to start again, to explore alternatives. So what happens if actually we don't have the screens on for so long? What happens if we have those meetings that we plan to have in person, online, and so on? Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, at the end, it also links to the case studies that we've done, which Lou will talk about a bit later, about how different uh, digital artists uh, raised awareness of the impact of uh, art digital activities through their artistic practice. And I think Alice has already touched on lots of these. I, I'm often asked about easy wins. I just thought I'd, all, I'd just share a few quickly. Uh, there's some of our favorites, so to host your website on a server powered by renewable energy to buy refurbished IT equipment. Alice has already said that, but I think that's the single biggest thing you can do. And as well as to make the devices you have last longer. So we now buy all our new iPads. Um, the iPads that are new to us, we buy them secondhand. Um, uh, laptops are more energy efficient than desktop computers. Um, is, and if you want to stream things, YouTube is good and Google Meet and Microsoft Teams are better than other uh, online meeting platforms that are available, naming no names. Um, and uh, if it's possible in your country, it's possible in the UK, it's not possible in every country, but you can choose a renewable energy supplier for your energy. And that's obviously one of the biggest things that you can do. This has got nothing to do with digital, but I say it to everybody, check the policy of your bank and pension provider. There's a website called bank.green that certainly works for UK banks to tell you uh, what the bank that you have your money in is investing in. Um, and also talk to your clients, suppliers, funders, can they help with the easy wins? Can you, uh, can they remove barriers to achieving them? So yeah, um, that was a little bit of a tangent, but um, yeah. So we're now gonna move on to some case studies of digital art and artists that are raising environmental awareness through their practice. Thanks, Dan. Um, so yeah, we so over the last few years, we've conducted a series of conversations with artists and researchers whose work uses and or critically reflects on digital tools and environmental challenges to really help us gain some insight into a range of ideas and approaches. 
Um, I'm just going to share a few of the case studies um, and some of, I guess, some of the key reflections from each of the artists. But I really encourage you to to go to our website. So that's the the uh, the conversations are kind of hosted across all of our websites, um, and just and kind of read more. We try to keep them as sort of as brief and as digestible as possible. But there's lots of really interesting insights there. Um, I suppose one of, I guess one of the key things that came through, and this is something that Alice touched on earlier, was just this kind of idea about sort of complexity, you know, this kind of, I guess, the hidden nature of the internet. Um, and, you know, part of why we did this project was a way to kind of understand that. And I think, you know, something that each of these artists are doing is, is, is sort of trying to understand that better through their practice and make that more visible. Um, so the first case study is... Um, was a conversation with an artist researcher called Vlad Anjola, and it was uh, kind of focused on a project called Anatomy of an AI, uh, which he did with another sort of artist researcher called Kate Crawford. Um, so Vlad Ann is sort of interested in, in kind of ideas of digital labor, exploitation, and visible in infrastructures, and what he took what he terms as technological black boxes. And what this project does, it kind of basically breaks down the Amazon Echo um, as an anatomical map of human labor, data and planetary resources. And it's presented as a map and essay. Um, so as part of this kind of research project, artistic project, um, Jola kind of painstakingly sort of researched kind of the materials, the human labor, the data that went into creating one Amazon Echo. And as part of this, he visited many of the locations um, involved in this system um, and meeting many of the kind of the humans involved along the way. Um, so sort of some of the, I guess, some of the key learnings or things that kind of that 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 Vladan took away from the project. Um, the biggest one he said is that he learned that extending the life of objects is actually the most important thing. And thinking about how as consumers we can counteract planned obsolescence of digital devices. Um, you know, and he talked about, you know, these kind of supply chains being really complex and opaque and actually sort of traveling to these places when researching the systems was really important in terms of connecting himself to the story and to really feel the materiality of those places, in, you know, in order to kind of communicate that more widely. Um, and just taking a quote from... Um, the conversation. So he says, if you start to think about infrastructures, data centers and everything, then you eventually get to the mines in Congo or, or elsewhere in the globe. And then the questions aren't the same anymore. Because before it was about privacy, security, data exploitation, this kind of stuff. But when you start to think from the position of supply chains, then the main problem is a problem of labor and a problem of nature. Um, so just moving on to the next slide, Dan. So the next artist that I'm going to mention is an artist called Joanna Moll. Um, so Joanna um, is an artist that, that kind of very much focuses on the critical exploration of the techno-capitalist narratives at the intersection of art, technology and investigative journalism. Um, she's done a number of projects that kind of look at this topic. Um, Two examples that I'm going to mention here, one's called Deforest, um, the other one is called The Hidden Life of an Amazon User. And all of her projects kind of explore this sort of disconnect that we have between our use of the internet and its material impact on the physical world. Um, and what Joanna's really interested in is kind of how we translate these hidden costs, you know, in, in ways that are relatable but beyond numbers, because some of these kind of quantities that we're talking about can be quite alien. Um, so for example, DeForest um, came to life because Joanna wanted to find a way to make um, some concepts kind of more understandable. Um, and within this, she kind of used, you know, the idea of a tree, which she thought that everyone could relate to. Um, and DeForest is a net based artwork that shows the number of trees needed to absorb the amount of CO2 generated by the global visits to Google.com every second. Um, and really what she's interested in is like counteracting views of complex ecosystems being considered um, mere economic externalities. Um, so in terms of some of the key things that came from Joanna's talk, um, just moving on to the, oh, is that the right slide, Dan? Um, so she, you know, she kind of talked about how she really felt there was kind of uh, much more of an awareness 
now the kind of materiality of the internet, which is a really good thing. Um, she also um, was really convinced that art is a really powerful tool for creating a space for this critical reflection and kind of being able to navigate some of these conversations. Um, and then she also talked about, obviously, through exploring this stuff in her practice, you know, it made her much more aware of how she was creating the work. So a lot of her um, a lot of her projects are web-based projects. So for her, every time she does a project, you know, there's there's a real kind of weighing up of kind of what she wants to share, how important it is that she shares, <laughs> she shares the work versus obviously the energy that we used in kind of creating that web-based project. Um, you know, and she sort of talked about kind of if you put the environmental impact as a priority when you're thinking about projects, it, you know, it's really interesting to see how that changes your approach to the work that you're making. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about... Just to say, Lou, we're at time, I think. Okay. Maybe just do memo quickly. Okay. Um, so just very quickly, so Memo um, is an artist that works with emerging tech and computation. Um, and we talked to Memo about the work he was doing around the ecological impact of NFTs. Um, so you can see in, the, in this kind of image that um, he... So he's kind of calculated in less, in less than six months, one artist multi-edition NFT had a footprint of 160 tonnes of CO2. Um, which is the same as an EU's, EU resident's entire electricity consumption for 70, 77 years or flying for 1,500 hours. Um, so part of the reason he wanted to do this work because he just didn't feel like people really understood the, um, the impact of NFTs. So it's a really interesting conversation. I won't kind of go into it too much, but, you know, he's kind of saying, like, you know, he really felt that people weren't aware and, you know, there needs to be more open conversation about this in a way that, um was useful and helpful and and kind of um that there were other options out there as well um but yeah i'll leave it there <laughs> yeah thank you very much and uh do feel free to get in touch with us because we've just sort of skimmed the surface of what we can do and do also check out the networkcondition.com for the tool and uh, links to the case studies there thank you very much thanks great thank you dan thank you Lou. Those were really great examples. I'm glad that we had time to share them. Um, and then in the last 20 minutes that we have, I'm very happy to introduce you to our last speaker, Soliman Lopez. He's a contemporary artist specialized in art, science, biotech, sociology, and technology. Soliman is the founder of the Art Disc Museum, Olia Bio Cryptocurrency, Hytron's DNA-based digital entities, and innovation director at the ESAT in Spain. Soliman, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much for having me on board this uh, interesting uh, seminar uh, about things that are very complicated in my side as an artist because you know we are trying to find a way to make as mass sustainable as possible with our own practice, but sometimes it's quite complicated. And I will talk to you about this um in my last project the manifesto Torricola, that um, um i'm going to present here so yeah my name is Solima lopez i'm a spanish artist i'm based in in paris um uh, it was there where this project began i was in collaboration with an institute uh, there the institute for future technology that is part part of the paul da vinci in la defense in, in in paris um the challenge was i did some kind of residency there of uh, around two months exploring the biomateriality um, and the concept of the Manifesto Torricola. And I'm going to tell you more. Um, this is like a, some kind of introductory, uh, introductory video.
So basically, um, what we did in collaboration with Vivian uh, Rosen, that he was, he was the, um, the director of this residency, and also in collaboration with uh, bioinformatic uh, Javier um, um, Forment, um, the, the biologist um, um, went uh, root in the University of Washington. The challenge was how we can actually create an artwork zero, zero impact for for nature in terms of the of the materiality and at the same time a holder or something of uh, an object that is holding a, an artistic uh, message. So the manifesto terricula basically it's containing all those concepts in 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 one in one object that is the three D printed. Uh, in collagen ear that is containing in its own molecules, in its, in its own materiality, 16 molecules of DNA that are representing the text of the Manifesto Terricola. Uh, the ear has been already used in many, in many other ages in the in art history, you know, from, from Van Gogh, who was cutting him, uh, it, it sound, uh, his own uh, ear just to be here, let's say, like a, some kind of revolutionary act of being here. Also, we have the, um, the background of Stellar installing this ear in the in the front ha hand of, of his body. And also we have the experiment with Joe, uh, Joe Davis uh, introducing DNA uh, information in, in mouse uh, ears. <clears throat> in all those cases, let's say that those ears were talking about talking more like a, in a single, uh, um, let's say, selfish perspective because they hardly was talking about them, themselves. But my ear, it's something that is externally produced from our body, but with something that is belonging to our own essence, that is the collagen. And at the same time, it's something that is um, uh, really addressing the, the, the big problematics that we have as humans to, to be in this planet. For those are, that are not um, Latin um, speakers, Terricola, it's, it's a terminology that is coming from Terra. Terra is the earth and cola is to cultivate or to culture. So um, this is, uh, let's say, uh, the naming of the project is coming from from, from there. Uh, what we are watching here is the, um, the encoding of of the text that is the very base of the project. The, this text is not so so long, but uh, at least we have uh, four different blocks of content that are analyzing uh, different perspective from the relationship in between science and religion, uh, the transhumanity, the ecological transition, and for sure about what I mean. I mentioned like the intellectual sphere that is um, an intangible uh, sphere of knowledge that we are creating as artists um, uh, virtually around the world. So this is me uh, revealing the content uh, inside the glacier for the very first time. I was reading uh, the text uh, to the inner side of this glacier that uh, casually, I mean, it's very, it's very similar to some kind of tympanus um so yeah it was a very special moment for me to reveal this content to to the glacier itself this is the location where we were working uh, and installing the the ear it's in esbalbar esbalbar is a place that was already um, signified as a, as a some kind of capsule of time because we have the uh, the, the seed bowl already installed there where we have a lot of diversity of different um, uh, cereals and and, and and seeds from 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 different um, parts of the world. It's a very controversial project because the diversity that is represented there, it's uh, maybe and potentially re representing some uh, different interests of uh, or different companies. Uh, so this is a part of the of the whole DNA that has been stored in the um, in the um, in the in the molecules and as i mentioned these those are the the, the main uh, the main um, uh, blocks of content uh, you can see the rest of the text uh, in the in the website manifestotoricola.com uh, this is the process i don't know if you are familiar with the dna storage uh, is my five uh, fifth sorry uh, project related with this technology we we did the very first one working with the Hardis Museum, um, a museum that I founded in a hard drive in 2013. It was the very first museum who, who has a, a, a backup uh, in DNA. But basically, we take the text that is a, it's a regular TXT file. Then with Python language, we uh, make the transition from, from a binary code from ones and zeros to ACTG that are uh, representing the amino acids of the of the of the DNA. And then in the lab, 
uh, um, we synthesize uh, artificially the, the molecules of the DNA for producing uh, physical uh, molecules to to be introduced in other in other materials. This is how uh, how the, the 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 preliminary assays of the ear looks like in the middle of the image. You can see um, the, the the ear in, in the lab in a petri dish, and then you can see the ear introduced in the in the glacier. So <clears throat> after that, I I was working with different uh, different formats to 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 spread the word of the of the project. From a video installation like uh, this large scale uh, video, um, uh, video uh, that has been installed in, in in Istanbul recently, or the um, the, the teaser that is representing uh, some images about the, the expedition we did we did yet there. Um, and here I would like to make um, uh, a small recap about the project because as we are talking about sustainability and we are like like looking for solutions to make the the artistic practice uh, like more sustainable i should say that i was trying to find the way of making this this um, excursion this uh, expedition um let's say uh, less impacting for the environment as possible but it was almost impossible uh it was super complicated to get there without taking a plane it was super impossible to move yourself in the Iceland without a snow motor bike um, that was making a, a, a lot of noise. Everybody was telling why, why in the Arctic you, you you can't see beers. Beers is because you know we are making a lot of noise, so they are not around anymore. Um, but in terms of materiality, we did our super good uh, good job. That means that uh, DNA is something that's already in nature. It's already used for tracking um, the pollution uh, that is coming from glaciers going directly to the sea because you can trace where the, the pollution is coming with the source of, of, of the water is coming from. You can separate and you can trace the water thanks to the DNA with zero impact. And for sure, the collagen is something that is also belonging to the nature and in, in contact with, uh, with with the sun and with the radiation, uh, it's, um, it become nothing in, 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 in a couple of hours. Um, <clears throat> And secondly, uh, it, with the with the revealing of this project um, uh, into the idea of introducing this year with this message in in a glacier is also something that is talking about the 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 fragility of our own ecosystem. That means that if we continue uh, melting the glaciers, the year will be like in the surface in a couple of years, and then will the the message uh, will disappear. So it's talking about this ephemeral and, and, and for sure this controversial connection in between everything that belongs to the digital world and everything that it's coming from, from the mother earth. Um, and we cannot uh, even understand one without the other one. So uh, both are part of the same uh, ecosystem, um, but we are not taking care about that. I mean, we are producing and producing digital information and we don't know exactly how to, 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 to connect it in a, in, a, in a proper way with the, with the nature. So uh, finally, my uh, perspective with the project is, and it's something that I already did uh, with the olive oil and to make a, some kind of tribute to the to agriculture or to the product that is coming from the, from the earth, is how we as artists, we can uh, resignify the nature uh, with the introduction of something that is purely um, purely code as the as the nature it is, and how we can actually can change the way that we are really um, and, and facing and we are really understanding what means nature. Um, and this is something that we we did it with uh, with this project because finally the, that glacier it's not the it's not a, a let's say a normal one because it's already resignified because it's holding a, a, an artistic message. Um, to keep the message alive, need, we need to keep the iceberg alive. Um, and I think it's a very good strategy to, to make people consciousness about the relationship and the, the really close relationship that we have to provoke uh, in the production of, of, of art in, 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 many, in many, many different ways. Um, and to finish, um, maybe I think it could be interesting, we can comment uh, in between us about the project. Um, also, DNA for me is something that is belonging to our basic essence, um, and also trying to the, the place is trying to really uh, to really understand what humans we are as as a species. Um, and, and in parallel, with when I was in, in the Arctic, I was really thinking about why we have this notion of colonization in everywhere. 
the Arctic is a place that is the, the condition of life is are super extreme. You cannot be even in touch with nature because you have to be isolated with a lot of layers of, of clothes to protect yourself from the from the from the from the cold. Um there's a lot of humans there. They have hotels, they have uh, restaurants. Uh, there's something now, it's an island that is becoming now uh, super touristic because they stop the, um, the extraction of petrol um, and, the, uh, and the, the killing of whales and, 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 and other mammals. Um, um, and now they are trying to move forward with this new economy that is based in, in tourism. So uh, when I'm talking about the Terricola Manifesto, uh, the Terricola Manifesto is also proposing the possibility of understanding um, the, the evolution of the earth in the way that is um, is not going to be our home anymore. And at that point, obviously, we have to talk about um, terraformism. We need to talk about many different um, other conceptual possibilities that we have today to really emphasize and to really think about the future of uh, the relationship in between nature and human. Um, I don't think I'm, I'm extending me uh, too much, but uh, this is the, the concept uh, around the project. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, many different ways of, of uh, presenting the, the, the concept. This, is, this is done, was done in, in, in Venezuela. Uh, it was a solo show uh, representing the, the project. This is the, the, the conceptual map I was working with. Um, if you are interested, I can, I can share it. Um, um, because I, here I mentioned all the challenges from the materiality to the, to the geographically um a choosing of, of of the place to install the um, the the ear and finally the idea is to create some kind of social movement with the ear as a as a main uh iconography we are also making an uh, music album with the son uh, sonification of the dna this is the this is the um, the conceptual map of uh, of this sonification basically we were uh, taking the the pair pair of bases uh from the dna corresponding to different notes in the um, in the um, in the scale of music uh, we have been already produced like 16 uh, midi files and we are inviting musicians and other artists to interpret the the, the, the music and the, um, and, the, and the score so everything is is here um, just to finish, uh, I would like to say that my main uh, inspiration of the project was related with the vibration, um, the electromagnetism uh, that, are, that is coming from the Earth. I don't know if you are familiar with the uh, human resonancy, but Schumann uh, uh, discovered that uh, our planet was vibrating in a very regular frequency that it was uh, measured as 7.8 hertz, and the human brain uh, when we are about to sleep or when we are about to meditate, we are exactly in the same range of hertz. So that means that at some point our brain was in, in balance with the earth. And I said at, what, at some point, because now the earth, uh, these measurements um, are increasing a lot. Now we are about 20 hertz as a middle, middle measurement in the earth. That means that we are not anymore in balance with the, with the frequency of the earth. Um, we have two options. We have the option of stop everything. Um, and when I mention stop everything is that we as humans, we are a lot of humans in the world, even if Elon Musk says that we are not so much. <laughs> but we are a lot of people who are spreading our own brain waves all around the, all around the globe that is increasing the, um, this measurement. And for sure, the using of technology is increasing a lot this, uh, these measurements. And in my perspective, I think that we cannot reverse the, the evolution that we are producing as human, but we can change the way that we are envisioning the future. And technology, for sure, is a, is a very important tool to really enhance, enhance our consciousness and increase our level of uh, balance with the Earth. So but basically, that's my positive message uh, in the project. Um, I hope you enjoyed the idea, and I'm here if you want to, to know more about the, the process. Thank you, Solomon. This was great. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, discussions and conversations to follow for sure. We have five minutes left and I'd like to ask you a um, quick question and then Lou and, and Dan as well. Um, but I got very intrigued about this 3D printed biodegradable here that you produce that carry on um, this manifesto for the earth that is then um, installed in, in the ice. I just was curious to get your opinion, Soliman, on um, what do you think of the realistic possibility of DNA being stored 
being storage for data information because uh, we know at the moment it's quite expensive it's time consuming how do you see this in the future as being a possibility I think it's a real possibility. Actually, there's a lot of companies who are increasing the capacities of uh, of, the of the storage in, in DNA. Uh, for sure, it's more sustainable than any kind of server because the, uh, to keep the DNA alive, it's just a question of to have it in a regular condition. That means that no extreme one. Uh, for sure, the DNA has a, an extremely capacity of survive in different conditions. As we can see in, 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 in history, we have samples of DNA that are coming from, from millions of years. Um, the thing is that, as you said, it's something that is very expensive, but I think that today after COVID and after the, the relationship in between society and biotechnology in many different ways, because we were all, all, all the day long um, experimenting how we connect our body with the PCR and with the mobile phone to see the results. So I think that people now is naturalizing, let's say, the biotechnology in many different ways. Um, the industry, for sure, uh, there's a lot of companies that now they have even a small machine to analyze in real time DNA samples. Um, and and it's, it's something that is uh, as many other technologies, no? When, when we were recording um, music, you know, in, in city rooms, it was something, okay, wow, we have we have the machine at, uh, at home, you know, to create our own city room and our, our own uh, CD to listen to music. And I think it's gonna, it's gonna happen exactly the same. The thing is that, even if we are talking about something that is totally and purely belonging to the nature, we need technology to, to, to decode it. So it's all the day long we have this notion of, 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 of um, some kind of parale uh, parallelism in between both technologies. And yesterday we were talking about how is human as human. I think that the most interesting thing could be to really understand a new language, uh, to read the information, the data information without the using of external technologies. And that should be amazing. For example, I can see those A, A, C, T, G, and I can understand the, what means that in ones and zeros, and I'm I mentally uh, visualize an image, for example. That could be a super, super interesting uh, point of evolution in humanity and in art, for sure. Um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll um, you know, separate ourselves from the device. That is, uh, is not a problem. Great, thank you. Um, moving on to Lou and Dan. Um, just briefly, if you could perhaps um, tell us a bit more about your view on how the creative community is reacting to this environmental work in relation to digital impact. Have you seen any positive change? I mean, you've shared some great examples, but on a more global level, um, could you see some sort of shift happening? Um, so loads of people have used the tool. So something's happening, at least in terms of people thinking about stuff. Um, I think... I think what's really helped when I've been sort of sharing these things with people or when people are feeding back on what's useful for them is that so many of our other impacts are more tangible. So like waste is the most tangible thing. And then people get that traveling is far, but but this all seems so remote. So I didn't do it today because you were doing that, Alice, but I, like really showing people what a server farm looks like and, um, you know, showing people the miners in the condo. <laughs> Here are some children digging in a mine. Like, so the way, the more we can do to really make those things visible to people, the more impact it has. I think we struggle a lot with procurement policies. So like the for fast familiar we can do whatever we want so we're a micro organization the university where i teach refuses to give me a second hand laptop so i think for big institutions it's about really rethinking procurement policies and what's good in in the arts within the uk is that julie's bicycle can sort of support with that i guess um so yeah that's a slightly a long answer but that that's where i feel we are with things what about you lou yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely agree with all that. I mean, I think it, it feels like there is there is a shift in terms of awareness of the sort of the, the physical infrastructure that sits behind the internet. I think there's definitely a lot more, yeah, a lot more awareness of that. And I think, you know, for us coming together as three really small organisations, you know, I think it's just really important to sort of share what you can, you know, as you know, we've kind of just been learning as we've been going along, really. And I think, you know, it's, Certainly the artists that we're working with are, are really interested in learning more about how it works, things that, you know, they as artists can do to kind of mitigate that and how we can support that as an organisation and share that learning. So it definitely feels like there's a, there is a shift in awareness and people then exploring how they can make change.
Thank you very much. I think Pia is going to join us in a second. Yes. Yeah, I think you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> so I spent the time. Uh, so thank you. Uh, everyone who joined us today this webinar and wonderful guests thank you for your insight and the expertise I, it's been really inspiring afternoon and um, for the audience we would be happy to receive your receive your feedback about the webinar and the ideas for the future please catch this QR code or we have also a link in the chat and if you have any additional questions you can reach out uh, directly Julia or me and I want to thank you, Errol, and have a wonderful rest of the day.